Hello, my name is Michael Simonson. I am the Director of Public Outreach for the Leo Beck Institute. And I'm also head of the Dr. Robert Ira Louie Reference Services Division at the Leo Beck Institute. Um, I wanted to welcome everyone. Um, and I was asked to present something from our collections just for a little close-up look. And so what I did is I chose a few items related to the historian Heinrich Gretz. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Ta-da, there we go. Hope you can all see it okay. Um, Heinrich Gretz. He was, in a sense, um, the first encyclopedic Jewish historian. Um, for close to a century, I would say, from the late 19th into the 20th century, he, his um, history of the Jews, which was a multi-volume set, different numbers, depending on who was the publisher, um, it was basically the number one bar mitzvah gift <laughs> for um, people both in Europe, in Germany, Austria as well, and in fact for people all over the world. And it was published in multiple languages. Uh, Heinrich Gratz was born in 1817 in a smaller community in the Posen district. And this uh, area is now part of Poland. At the time it was Germany. Um, one thing important about uh, Gretz is his own uh, academic background. So he had a traditional training, Jewish education and yeshiva, but then he went on through German universities. Uh, for a while he was in Heidelberg, I believe. He was in Jena. <clears throat> He was in Breslau. And um, it was here he uh, left much of his traditional Jewish education and also um, became, as were many German Jews at this time, most you could say, becoming more um, secularized. And um, in, at the universities, he was studying a variety of topics. Uh, not just the traditional uh, Jewish instruction, obviously. This is the Breslau Seminary. And this was a seminary for people training for the rabbinate or, uh, rabbinate or for other uh, Jewish religious needs. Uh, it was founded in Breslau as a conservative seminary and Heinrich Gretz himself identified as a conservative Jew. So I'm talking about conservative as in the conservative movement. So an area between the reform movement, which was taking greater hold in Germany, and the traditional orthodox movement that um, Heinrich Gretz and many others came out of, but now were um, secularizing from as they more and more assimilated into um, an identity as a German, and in the case of Gretz and his colleagues, German academics. So <clears throat> earlier historians um, before Heinrich Gretz, oh, and I should say about this, the reason this picture is here, this is where Heinrich Gretz worked. Um, he was a professor at the Breslau Seminary for many years. That was most of his career. Um, so earlier historians uh, wrote, wrote thin volumes about Jewish history. They were usually written by non-Jewish people and uh, they just concerned largely the facts. Then there were some also Jewish writers, of course, but these also were, were slim volumes. Um, and, and were also more a, a listing of facts. There were also this history um, in Orthodox Judaism of martyrologies. These are in a sense history books, but they're just listings of victims 
of pogroms and, and anti-Semitic violence for the most part. These are the kind of things still recited sometimes in uh, memorial services or during the high, holi high holidays by some. Um, so earlier historians anyway wrote these thinner volumes and Gretz decided that he was going to instead create a giant encyclopedic narrative covering all of Jewish history. Um, as I said, he's posed between the modern Orthodox movement, and it, become, it was becoming modern Orthodox um, under Samson Raphael Hirsch, and the, and the um, reform movement. He's right in between, and he's, he's part of the what's called the Yudish of Wissenschaft, which is really the, um, the uh, studying, in this case, the studying of history and other subjects and Judaism and any other religion with a kind of um, academic, factual, scholarly approach instead of just a, in the religious sense, and just belief alone. Of course, these writings were all in German. This was all intended to reach, you know, a larger audience through the vernacular. Um, so the history of Jews was written between 1853 and 1870. Um, and, and originally it was over 10 volumes, but then as it was picked up and published both um, in Europe, but then around the world, uh, sometimes it was 11 volumes, sometimes it was five volumes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, here we have a picture of Heinrich Gratz as the professor. And he's um, in the, uh, his picture is gracing this uh, first volume. <laughs> here is a set of, here is a set of the history of the Jews by Gretz, published as six volumes. So the Leo Beck Institute has all of this in our collections. The picture I showed at the beginning of Mr. Gretz, uh, copies of his encyclopedic history of the Jews, we also have some correspondence between him and other colleagues. That's a small body of correspondence, but interesting. Um, so with the history of the Jews, uh, one thing about it is that this was the first time, and Gretz said this himself, that he was writing as a Jew and for the Jewish people. Um, up to now, uh, history of the Jews had largely been written by non-Jews, and it was not really necessarily for Jews in any way. So uh, to do this, he also, uh, as a product of his time, uh, was writing history in a way that it was also arguing a thesis. It, it had to have a master narrative. Um, today, I think still, we like to think of history and books about history as presenting just facts. But I think anyone who studies history knows that historiography actually is, a, is often a set of arguments um, that are being presented, tied into a master thesis. So um, Gretz did the same. His work was very readable. I would say it reads almost like a, a fictional, almost like a, <laughs> as goofy as it sounds in some ways, a James Michener book if you will, where, you know, there's action and you're following these individuals and etc. But he was a historian, so he's, these are also facts at the same time. He's kind of dramatizing existing things, existing facts and things that happen. So what is his master thesis in the history of the Jews? It is basically that um, despite consistent persecution and anti-Semitism, the Jews succeeded in history, surviving and doing good for themselves and the larger society around them. And they did this because of their uh, Jewish morality, their strong Jewish ethics, and their intellect. So... I, this is still a, uh, an argument, I would say, 
uh, that exists within Jewish historiography today. Uh, that, um, you know, it's about overcoming odds and being uh, superior in some ways, intellectually or ethically or morally. And because of that, making things work for yourself and even benefiting the larger society around you. And um, it's not to say that that argument is completely unfounded. Uh, of course, however, um, arguments did break out. Not everyone agreed this should be the master narrative of Jewish history. Um, but it ignored, for example, according to critics, uh, example, pe uh, people like Jews who were not as ethically or morally good. Uh, the everyday person who happened to be Jewish. And also a kind of morality tale that runs through the books itself, which I'll show you an example, example of. Uh, for Heinrich Gretz, I should say, Talmud and the ancient um, writings were very important as well. And, and so he, he kind of starts, of course, with this early history and grounding Judaism in a kind of classical tradition. So here we have an example of that. So he, one thing Gretz did is he said, you know, the um, Romans, the Greeks, the Germans, whatever, whatever, they all have this class, the Germans last one that they have this classical literature and this classical flowering history. Greece, for example, has, um, has the Odyssey. It has the poems of Homer. What do the Jews have? So Gretz was interested in writing about early um, Jewish history, but taking that history, the Talmudic teachings, and placing them um, positioning them as the classical literature of the Jewish people, which actually had not uh, really been done before. So in this part, um, we see, and I'll read a little bit here. Uh, he's talking about early Hebrew poetry in the biblical world. Hebrew poetry in its early stages was deficient in depth and elegance, but it has two characteristics which in the course of time were developed to the highest stage of refinement. With regard to form, it exhibited a symmetry in the component parts of each verse. The same train of thought was repeated with appropriate variations in two or even three divisions of the verse. In the treatment of a theme, the muse of early Hebrew poetry displayed a tendency to irony, this being the result of a twofold conception, namely that of the ideal aspect by the side of antithetic, antithetic reality. So <coughs> what Gretz is doing here is he's discussing this early Hebrew poetry, but outside of a religious context, he's judging it and critiquing it on its value as poetry, in a sense, in an academic sense, this Yudisha Wissenschaft sense. He's also, throughout this part, talking about how this is a classical literature um, of, the, of the Jewish people. Okay, so here is another uh, part, which I think is kind of interesting. Uh, this is after the Inquisition, expulsion of Jews from Spain and Portugal and about the anti-Semitism of Philip II. So Philip II was indeed very anti-Semitic, um, but as it says at the bottom on the left, Philip II lived to see the two races whom he had most savagely hated and persecuted, the Netherlanders and the Jews, in a measure joined hands to destroy what he had created. For Holland derived advantage from the Jewish settlers from Portugal. Then it goes on. So once again, the Jews have kind of outwitted their enemies. Philip II died in September 1598, a terrible warning to obstinate, unscrupulous despots. His body was covered with abscesses and vermin, which made him such an object of horror that his trembling servants approached him only with disgust. The great empire which he bequeathed to his feeble son, Philip III, was likewise diseased. It was succumbing to its infirmities and no longer possessed influence in the Council of Europe. So how this part is written, is if, if one goes on with it, is Philip II was an evil king. He was anti-Semitic. He did bad things to Jews. But now, you know, reading this 
in line with this master narrative of, of the entire series of books. You know, Philip II is kind of being punished or getting his comeuppance, as you will, for his anti-Semitism and his uh, uh, attacks on Jews. Now, other historians at the time, too, would say, well, I mean, when Philip II gets sick and did these terrible things happen because he had been mean to the Jews and because he was a despot? I mean, does that one thing really have to do with the other? So that's a kind of example where he, <clears throat> Gretz himself, ties in this idea that of, of, of almost a divine punishment from God on Philip II and on other um, anti-Semitic rulers and figures in history. Uh, the Jews overcome these problems and then uh, these despots. And then, um, of course, these despots kind of die uh, in terrible ways. Um, in a sense, they, they're suffering this divine punishment for attacking the Jews. I should say, before we go on, in Gretz's work, the, um, the narrative is told largely through in every generation. There's anti-Semitism, but there's one or two uh, people who step forward, who, Jewish men, always men, who, uh, you know, because of their, as I said, their intellect, their moral superiority in the situation, their strong sense of Jewish ethics, again, overcome the odds. All right. Now this is a little bit about mysticism. So Gretz wanted to write a history. So it started with the ancient world and the classical Jewish world, making the ancient Jewish world a part of the classical world. Then it will move on and go through this history with this master narrative. He also had a lot of issues with um, the um, Kabbalah and with Jewish mysticism as it developed in the uh, Babylonian and early modern European world. Uh, so here he's talking about it, and he says at the bottom of this page, the harm that the Kabbalistic doctrines of Luria caused in Jewish circles is inexpressible. Judaism became surrounded with so thick a husk of mysticism that it has not even yet succeeded in entirely freeing itself and showing its true kernel. Through Luria's influence, there was formed, side by side with the Judaism of the Talmud and the rabbis, a Judaism of the Zohar and the Kabbalah. For it was due to him that the spurious Zohar was placed upon a level with, indeed higher than, the holy scriptures and the Talmud. So why is he so against uh, Jewish mysticism? Well, part of it is because of this master narrative. So it starts with this ancient classical literature, where we don't really learn if it's true or not. We just, we just hear it and hear it described in a kind of academic scholarly manner. And then we move on through history, as I've described. But one thing going on for Jews in 19th century Europe, um, especially in Eastern Europe still, there was a lot of this um, idea that traditional Jewish life was filled with superstition. The Jewish religion was filled with superstition. Um, and so these people, these Yudish Wissenschaft scholars, were not keen on the orthodoxy of, of Eastern Europe as a whole. And Heinrich Gretz actually had uh, very little to say about uh, the masses of Jews in Eastern Europe, the, the Jews of the shtetl. So um, he saw um, he saw the Kabbalah and Zohar as part of this superstition that had, um, you know, was actually harmful to the Jews. And in fact, the Jews were constantly being accused uh, that their religion and their beliefs were superstitious and old-fashioned. And um, of course, that came out in various ways, like, you know, you should convert to Christianity. That's the one true religion. Then in this time, this 19th century time, it also became, you know, where intellectuals, where academics, uh, we're going to get rid of all this superstition in, in, in Judaism and in other religions. I mean, as it exists in Christianity too, and we're going to be uh, serious academic scholars. And uh, so it was important for the uh, people like Heinrich Gretz to be moving into this more secular academic world. They themselves had come from the more traditional Jewish orthodoxy, which has, was so often 
even by more secularized Jews, uh, condemned as superstitious and uh, filled with um, kind of a uh, cheap, cheap mysticism based on local folklores and so on and so forth. So this is why Gretz was not interested in uh, defending any kind of, of uh, mysticism. <clears throat> Moses Mendelssohn, this is an engraving at the Leo Beck Institute. This would be Heinrich Gretz's hero. Uh, Moses Mendelssohn, the late 18th century, he uh, was and remained Jewish, but he also became an important scholar, philosopher. Uh, he translated the Bible into, the, uh, into German for a Jewish audience who, who read German and, and also for others, um, uh, non-Jews as well. And he was in this position between this orthodoxy and between uh, more complete reforms that were to come after his lifetime. And so um, Heinrich Gretz saw Mendelssohn as one of these um, ideal Jewish heroes, overcoming the anti-Semitism of his time to um, become an important figure, not just in the Jewish, German Jewish world, but in the, in the German world as well. So as I said, not everyone uh, was a fan of Gretz and his views of history. Um, of course, as I said, there were there were Jews who were not um, impressed with it as well. In 1885, there was a meeting of the Jewish Historical Commission in Europe, and they actually did not invite him because they said that he, these were Jews, remember, and they said, he, um, we're just people and there's nothing superior about us being Jewish. And so, we, you know, we don't agree with your thesis. Despite that, that his books um, soon sold large volumes and were published um, all over the world in a variety of languages. Now, part of this fear of being of, of this idea of Jewish superiority was, of course, they were living, at least in Central Europe, in an anti, well, everywhere, in, a, in an anti-Semitic social environment. So, you know, they had um, the, the culturally uh, historians had um, long attacked Jews as in fact feeling superior or better than their non-Jewish neighbors. So one um, of the biggest historians of the time that Gretz was alive was Heinrich von Tr Trichka. Um, he was an important historian, a German historian, and he became a very big critic of Heinrich Gretz saying in essence, um, how dare Gretz proclaim the Jews are morally superior to us. They're ruining our German nation. They're, um, you know, destroying the economy, taking it over, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, Trishka, like many others, saw Gretz as um, defending uh, this kind of idea of Jewish superiority which Heinrich von Trichka, such as he has an anti-Semite, uh, wouldn't, couldn't stand. So they had a fight back and forth in the German press for 10 years. Uh, and people would read their columns, the back and forth and back and forth. And the question was, were the Jews good for Germany or not? And it was in one of these columns that Heinrich von Trichka said, the Jews are our misfortune, the Judens in unser Unglück. And later that was taken up by the Nazis and it became one of their biggest anti-Semitic slogans constantly used. So now this is a picture from in Nazi Germany many decades later. And uh, we see here, uh, the top says with the storm against the Jews, that's the newspaper Der Sturmer, which was an anti-Semitic paper. Then underneath on the panel, along with all this anti-Semitic literature, it says the Judens and Unser Unglück, the Jews are our misfortune. 
a rather strange legacy um, to come out of the Heinrich Gretz, Heinrich von Trichka battle. Nonetheless, um, as I said, Heinrich von, or Heinrich Gretz's uh, work was very popular. It was published um, all over the world and uh, it is still um, sometimes consulted and read today. I was just talking to someone actually who was reading it and, uh, and they were greatly enjoying it and they were learning a lot. And um, so I, I, I think that despite perhaps its fallacies within its own master narrative, its own thesis, this is how history is always written. And uh, uh, in the parts of it I have read, I have not read it all, um, I, I find it an enjoyable, interesting read. So I want to thank two sources for helping me with my little talk today. Um, one is Dr. Henry A. Bramson. And if you are interested in what I have to say, he gives a very nice lecture about Heinrich Gretz, fills in a lot of details. He has a series on YouTube, it's free. And you can just look up the title or his name, uh, Who is Heinrich Gretz? Biography is History by Dr. Henry Abramson. I also want to say I used the book Prophets of the Past, Interpreters of Jewish History, which had a nice part about Heinrich Gretz in it. This is by Professor Michael Brenner, and it was published in 2010. Uh, with that, I want to thank you for joining me today and learning a little bit about uh, a man that many people consider the world's first uh, real Jewish historian. Thank you.